So as you know, I'm a scientist, an academic, a doctor, but this is not primarily a series of scientific lectures. This is about understanding the challenges your children face and that you then face as their parents. About understanding the impact of these challenges on your child's happiness and well-being, but just as importantly, the impact on your happiness, your functioning, and your well-being. And in the center of all this is understanding a set of cognitive processes that we call executive function, EF. Now, understanding what happens when a child has weaker or less developed executive function, understanding the impact of this on themselves, their parents, you, and their family, and then some things you can do about all this. And we want to use research and science to help us do our best. So what is executive function? Executive function refers to a group of thinking or cognitive abilities that are essential for managing information and managing oneself. Self-control, ability to focus your attention, memory to keep in mind, working memory call it, we call it, to keep in mind what it is that you're trying to do at the moment, and cognitive flexibility so that if something doesn't work the first time a certain way, you can think about doing things a different way. So why are these functions important? What do we need them for? Well, these are essential to be able to analyze situations, to make plans and take action, focus and maintain your attention, to control yourself, your emotions, your frustrations, to remember what you're doing and how to do it. Important for managing time, for resisting distraction, to be able to switch your attention from one thing to another and to adjust your actions as needed to get the job done. So we all face these challenges, right? These are, I just went through a list of things that, that we all have to make effort to be able to do. And it's those executive functions that we draw on ourselves that I'm talking about now to enable us to do these essential life tasks and tasks essential for learning. <clears throat> so what are the, some of the situations that compromise executive function? Well, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is one. In fact, it's almost defined by difficulty with maintaining focus, uh, problems in working memory and self-control. Autism spectrum disorders similarly have problems with executive function, not exactly the same as the ones with ADA, children with ADHD have, but still in the same general category. And maybe the issues of cognitive flexibility are a little more uh, important there. Sensory processing disorders have their own set of sensory processing challenges, but almost all the time also associated with executive function problems and other specific learning problems like dyslexia or other specific learning disabilities, dysgraphia, trouble learning to write. Now, on top of these causes, we know that trauma and stress interfere with the development of executive cognitive functions. And we all have trauma and stress in our lives, and some of us, unfortunately, more than others. And that can add to compromising or challenging executive function development on top of the other things that I've listed. So what is the impact of this? And what I want, a reason I'm spelling this out is I want you to be able to keep in mind when children are having trouble learning, facing challenges because they learn differently and it doesn't necessarily match the situation that they're in. What are the things that are getting in their way and that maybe then you have a better idea of what they're going through and how to help them. So they have trouble focusing their attention, keeping their mind on the task or what people are saying to them and then remembering what it is after they've been told or asked to do something and they have trouble with their self-control, which means that they're distracted by themselves with things that might come into their minds that they'd be rather, doing, rather be doing. 
So these impacts on learning and children, what's the effect on you as parents? Well, worry, right? You worry more about your children because you know that they have these difficulties and these challenges. Now, we all have challenges and all ch children and everybody has challenges as we know in life that are personal to us. But we're trying to understand specific set of challenges that children have who, who learn differently. And they are a cause for many parents to worry. And for children, it can impact their self-esteem because they're not learning as well in the setting of school and they feel less good about themselves. And that of course is cause for more worry for parents. But sometimes also it causes parents to have low self-esteem as if there's something wrong with you because your children are learn, learn differently and are having additional difficulties and personal challenges in the school setting. But it's not your fault. But still, we know that one of the things that parents feel sometimes is they're not as worthy and as capable themselves. And guilt, here, a quote from a father of a six-year-old with ADHD. I felt like I gave him my ADHD. I had to get over the guilt to actually be able to help him. So yes, it's not your fault. And you don't want to feel guilty because that only makes things worse for yourself and makes it harder for you to be helpful to your children. Now these problems and the, these challenges in their executive functions, not only impacts success and learning at school, but it directly impacts, as you all know, home life. Here's a scene that is probably all too familiar to some of you of, of children who don't have the internal structures of the executive functions to maintain an external structure in the world around them, which becomes a mess. And that goes back and forth then, the mess outside and the disorganization outside and the lack of structure inside. But what's one of the things that does to parents is frustration, right? I mean, I know that uh, one of my children had a lot of problems with this type of thing. and unbelievable you know how he could be comfortable it seemed in the mess all around him um, and not something that I was comfortable with and so it's frustrating because the children have difficulty actually following through with what might seem natural and appropriate to us oh I went the wrong way and um, when they have trouble uh, focusing their attention and care or remembering what to do, this is probably also familiar to at least a number of you, having to repeat yourself. One night, appears a quote from a parent, after I'd asked him five times to get undressed for his shower, I found him just staring at a poster in his room and fiddling with one of his toys. Oh boy, right? That's frustrating. And what about, where's it go? It goes deeper than frustration. And this is a hard thing for parents to, for, to feel comfortable admitting and dealing with, but you get angry and you can get angry repeatedly. And you know, it doesn't do you any good or them any good, but you're angry. Here's another quote from a parent. Underneath it all is anger. It's been a big part of my journey as an autism sensory processing disorder, ADHD mom. Most of the time I didn't even know it was there until it just bubbled up and I couldn't keep it bottled up anymore. I needed to start recognizing it and dealing with it. So that's one of the things we're gonna talk about, you know, think about at least. I want you to start thinking about it now and I'll have some suggestions uh, before we finish tonight of how do you deal with these emotions to make yourself happier and more comfortable and to make it better able to be helpful to your children at the same time. Because it all adds up to what? I mean, exhaustion, it's exhausting for parents. Life is exhausting for many of us in many ways, many times. But if you have the extra challenges of helping a child who has extra challenges, it's exhausting. 
and then it spills over. It can spill over to impact your relationships, uh, marital relationships. It can impact relationships with, with your own parents and how they feel about how you're doing dealing with your child. And these are supposed to be, hopefully, otherwise, we want them to be sources of support for you, right? In your, uh, in your partner relationships and your relationships with, with parents that they could be helpful to you. But the difficulties spread into that because of the challenges, the frustration, the anger, and the exhaustion. Now, on top of all that, if that's not enough, what are we all facing today with the pandemic? This is, I'm showing you here, uh, op-ed that I had, I wrote together with Goldie Hawn on how the impact of the, of the COVID pandemic on the stress levels in communities, families, and schools adds to the problems for every child in developing their executive cognitive functions because those executive cognitive functions, as I said earlier, are impacted in their development by stress. And uh, Goldie and I are working together in programs for schools uh, because she has a foundation that supports meditation programs. And we actually have two quite different programs, but it's interesting that they complement each other. And we'll talk a bit about meditation both this time and next time as something that's part of the tool set that you can use to make yourself feel better and to do with your children and help your children actually manage their own emotions. So what is the impact of COVID on all of us that would then translate into making the challenges you face as parents of children with who learn, learn differently uh, to uh, deal with those challenges? Well, there's increased stress, fatigue, anxiety, and depression. Let's just start with there for all of us. Just uh, our worlds have changed, our supports have changed, our activities have changed. And just reading the newspapers and looking at the numbers, our anger and frustration. And sickness and death in family and friends. And you on New York just know this all too well from the spring surge. So I understand the, the, the statistics over 25% in some communities of people lost a family member or a good friend. And then the ones who didn't die, there's sickness, right? And so there's sickness and death and family and friends and directly in the families, your families, some of your families for sure. And then loss of social supports because you don't have the ordinary activities that you have outside of the house. Loss of jobs stress because of income problems, loss of relaxation opportunities, disrupted family and household schedules and routines, and then the additional responsibilities that many face because of homeschooling and disruption in school. So it's a particularly hard time. And for that reason, you know, again, I commend District uh, 75 with this outreach program because so much starts in the home and there's so much on the parents to do and the families to do any support that we can give to, to make that better is certainly something that uh, is important and of value. So let's talk now about learning at home. We talked about the challenges that executive functions make for children to learn in school, executive, executive function challenges they have, and now how that impacts family life and the impact on you all as parents. On top of that, you want to help them learn at home. Every child has to learn at home. Homework is part of, of schoolwork. And learning at home is hard, and then particularly harm for, hard for a number of reasons who, uh, for children who have challenges with their executive function. Here's some quotes from parents. And these are actually related to when parents were trying to, uh, to do actually a lot of the homeschooling because the children were only going to school a couple days a week or maybe not at all. But it also applies to just homework assignments as, as you probably already know very well. So um, 
in one quote is, uh, he wasn't used to me asking him to do these activities. You know, he was used to the teacher asking him to do it. And he wasn't used to this kind of work from school coming in the, in the format, you know, an email and his Chromebook to do it at home in his Chromebook. Another parent, he, he would avoid the math and writing and go straight to his favorite subjects, science and social studies. Now, let me say something about that. Many children with executive function problems can pay attention for sustained periods of times for certain types of activities. Children with ADHD can play computer games for hours. They aren't particularly good for them, those computer games, because the reason that the children can engage with them is that they're highly arousing, they're stimulating, they capture their attention. And that is a high, that's fun. What is difficult, the problem when you don't have some strong enough executive functions is to do the things that aren't so much fun that don't give you the immediate excitement. And you have to do that. You have to be able to do that. And some of the things that come are difficult for you are the ones that you least like to do. And that takes the most structure, support, and executive function to do. So that's captured as a child who has some favorite subjects. That's wonderful. And you want to encourage that and draw on that but they're not gonna be able to do science successfully in the long run, right? If they can't do math and social studies, they need to be able to write papers too. That's part of the skill set they need to pursue their interests. So, and that's where the uh, weaker executive functions get in the way, controlling themselves, sustaining themselves, managing their motivation and emotion to spend the time doing things that they don't like to do as much and that are harder for them because of the ways they learn. They tend to want to do things, and this is part of managing your emotions and planning ahead to do things that give them the more immediate reward, right? And not the things that have the delayed reward that if you learn math, you're gonna be able to do better in science two or three years from now. Well, the third quote, there might be something when he opened it that was like really pretty a PDF that has lots of beautiful illustrations and fonts and even look at it and then just overwhelmed. Too much, too much sensory input at one time. That's a, another type of problem that children have. Their attention gets overwhelmed. And then here's a mother talking about herself and her, her description of her daily routine. She'd get up at 6 a.m., open up all her son's assignments and come up with a plan to get them done. Then she'd start her own full-time job working online. It was a lot. And at first, Wilmot didn't realize that her son was missing a critical part of school, recess. Now playing outside is one of the things that's become more difficult with COVID. And still one more thing uh, for parents to have to structure, keep safe and do help their children with. So it's something for you to think about is the importance of physical activity for many children uh, who have learned differently. Children with ADHD, for example, getting up and being able to move around. I've had children with ADHD explain that if I can, if, and mothers and fathers describe that, well, if he gets outside and, and runs laps for, for 15 minutes, he can come in and concentrate much better on his work. It's not the type of thing that's so easy if we're cooped up because of the pandemic. So keep that in mind as well. So another thing that makes learning at home more difficult is that most households don't have a dedicated space that they can say, okay, now you're in your school learning space. This is a space that the child at school has come to associate with learning and paying attention and working with their teacher. And if they're in a space that they become that they associate with watching TV or going on their device, other electronic devices and playing games or chatting with friends on the phone, um, those the space doesn't work in the favor of helping them with their executive function. It's easier for them to get distracted. And there are lots of distractions at home, not only the ones I mentioned, but things that other people are doing. Sound.
and from even if they're in a separate room, TV going on somewhere else. So you have to do the best you can to create a workspace that's free of distractions, that's quiet and enables them to, to concentrate better despite their trouble concentrating. And at home, you have challenges that you don't, you don't have the discipline structure of schools and schools have their own challenges, of course, with discipline and for some children who have problems like ADHD. But at home, um, there's so many things around them and you want them to have fun and to play and do those other things. And these things they've come used to be, that they like to do for the reasons I mentioned before, the computers or the phone are great attractions. And it's something that perhaps in the, in the third session, when we're sharing strategies that you all could share with each other, because I don't have, I have the answer there, how you deal with managing the appeal of electronic devices for children who have learning challenges and, and learn in different ways and have lower executive functions that, al that allow them to be more comfortable with delayed gratification and dealing with things that are difficult and require that extra cognitive effort. So uh, please, yeah, if you do have suggestions, think about that. Uh, after uh, next session, we're gonna talk about things that you can do with your children at home that are fun and it can help develop their executive functions. And the third session is gonna be this one where you are the experts and you'll be sharing your ideas and suggestions. Uh, this is probably a good one. Now, also uh, with the pandemic and with disruptions in school, because there are disruptions in school, despite the heroic efforts that are being made in New York City and District 75 in particular, you know, greater fear that your child will lose ground and then more occasions for conflict, right? Because, oh, the knobs, the gain, oh, the pressure has been turned up for, on everybody. The child feels more stress, you feel more stress, your worries go up, right? We talked about worries and whether you're doing the right thing as a parent, more occasions for conflict, a lot to deal with. So what are some of the adjustments then that you can make? So we're gonna start here with some ideas now. As I said, um, next time we're really gonna focus on the whole session on different things you can do with your children that'll help them develop their executive function skills and they'll feel better about it and those skills will get better and you'll feel better about it. But here's some other things that relate more particularly to managing the types of situations at home I've just described. And we're gonna get also to managing the impact of all this on you. So parents feel they have to do the impossible, you know. So this year, um, when things are more strained and difficult, realize please that different goals and accomplishments this year does not mean that they're worse. Adjust to the situation. Here's a quote from a parent. He now knows how to do his own laundry. Now, again, some of these go back to the time when the children were spending all the time at home and the parents and the schools with the hybrid learning online, you can't do it as much of it as effectively or as much time. But there's an example already of a little task. I mean, not so little, but a, 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 a task that has boundaries to it and that can be made little where, for example, you do laundry and your child does laundry in parallel and your child just has a few things to take care of and just follows you and does it the same way as you do it whether it's putting it in the in the wash and the clothes washing machine taking it out and putting it in the dryer and then taking responsibility for just those few items that will be his or her responsibility to make sure they end up where they're supposed to be after they're cleaned but that was the goal that a parent said okay I, I'm not going to be able to help him accomplish. He's not going to accomplish as much math or reading this year, but he can learn something else that's going to be valuable for him. And he now knows how to do his own laundry. Um, so, and then all the challenges of learning at home, if you don't put too much pressure on getting to the content right away and realize that they create an opportunity 
for learning new skills of organization, of time management, of how you organize the study space itself. That becomes the goal, not just to organize it so then they can do more math and you focus just on the math. It's actually working together to realize the importance and value of creating an orderly learning, quiet, quiet, orderly learning space for learning at home. So it's so important to get these goals right. To, and when I say get them right, I don't mean there's one right answer. I mean to get them appropriate to the situation that you're in and that your child is in so that they can be have a reasonable chance of success. Otherwise, the things we talked about at the beginning, right, the frustration, the guilt, the exhaustion, the anger, the conflict, it's all going to be turned up if the goals are, are inappropriately highly demanding on you because you feel the child has to do this much this right away, that's going to be a problem for you and for them. And when there's no good solution available, like there is unfortunately with, with sometimes because of COVID or you can't accomplish all the things that you would like, it's too easy to blame, right? Where do you put the blame? You blame the child, you blame yourself, you blame your spouse. You have to put the blame aside, replace the fear of losing ground with accomplishing different goals. So I told you I am an academic and I'm a scientist. So I wanna share with you some studies that show you that not only what you do know already before I told you, I don't think I really told you anything new about the challenges you face hopefully being able to understand them in relationship to these core executive cognitive functions and to see why it is a challenge has been helpful and will be helpful as we continue going through the additional sessions. But I also want you to see that scientists have confirmed that these are real extra demands on you all. These, each one of these pairs of bars represents a different study all published scientific studies comparing the stress level in parents of children who have autism spectrum disorders versus parents of children who are neurotypical. If you can see my cursor here, these are some studies just looked at mothers, some looked just at fathers, and some looked at both in terms of the rating of the stress level. And the blue bar in each study is the stress level in the parents whose children are on the autism spectrum and the orange bar, the children who are neurotypical. And you can see that on study after study, the parents have one and a half times as much stress. Even if the particular scale was such that the numbers were low, here you're going from 10 uh, about 10 to 25 or 30, that's two and a half times as much stress. Here you're going from a little over 60 to 100. So there you're, it's you know more than one and a half times as much, less from 100 to 150, more than one and a half times as much stress. No wonder you're tired. So here, uh, going back to the mindfulness meditation, this is just one study. Um, and it was looking at uh, distress, uh, negative uh, impact in general on life, uh, depression, and life satisfaction. And there was a mindfulness group and a control group. And the ones who got mindfulness, this was before the mindfulness, the first blue bar, this is after the training. So their distress level went down, the control group, no change the negative impact they felt on their life went way down, just a small change in the control group. Depression actually went up in the control group, went way down in the, in the group that did the mindfulness training and life satisfaction stayed the same in the control group and improved in the group that did the mindfulness training. So look at that. Now you have to call on your own executive functions and say, that's what the data is. The data is I'm under a lot of extra stress. It's impacting me, my health, my life, my relationships, and my ability to help my children. What are some of the things that I can do that the research shows can really help? And the thing about mindfulness meditation, 
we're talking about doing something 10 minutes a day and for free. If you go online, I just put a few links here. And uh, Jose, if you want to, if those can be put into chat or however you want, people can get them. But, you know, it took me two minutes to get those just by Googling free meditation apps. And um, you'll see also YouTube, there are free videos on YouTube for mindfulness meditation training. Try it. It can't hurt. Here's another study on an intervention called positive thinking. Huge improvements. Again, the, the blue bars are the ones that got the positive thinking training. The orange bars are the control groups. Marital happiness went way up. Life satisfaction went way up. A sense of resilience and ability to deal with problems by being able to reframe things in a positive way by, for example, saying, these are realistic goals. I can feel good about it. My child can feel good about it if we accomplish those. And then there's a sense of satisfaction and positive thinking. We're moving forward. The last thing I want to suggest is doing something positive for yourself can be a step one in helping your child. Something that's sort of a little thing can have a big effect on how you feel. Now, we all know this, you don't have to, we all have stresses. But what could you ask your partner or even your children to give you as a little gift? Don't be scared to ask about it because you need that for yourself and then you need it to be able to help your child better. Could be 15 minutes of quiet in the apartment for everybody. Could be meditation together as a family. But how about just quiet? Everybody just has a quiet time in the apartment. No matter, let them do what they want. You don't have to be in control of it if they just give you quiet time or 15 minutes for yourself, whatever it is that you could enjoy that to, to help you relax. Do some stretches. One night is your night to go to bed a little earlier, to get up a little later. 20 minutes where you can have a walk by yourself outside. So I already told you what we're going to be doing in the, in the subsequent sessions. Um, I was asked to remind you of those. I can leave the screen up for a minute. And I think that uh, we have enough time now. I think, Jose, if there's some questions. Yeah, we do have some time set aside. Um, folks, you can start submitting your questions using the Q&A function, um, and, we'll, and we'll go through it. Um, and as we go through it, uh, Dr. Wexler, one of the questions that's in here is, do you have any uh, suggestions or recommendations for just regular day-to-day -day activities that families can do together to help improve um, executive functioning for I have a, children? I have a bunch of them. So <laughs> please tune in. Repeat the date of, the, of my session two again. It's February what? Uh, session two is, I'll, I'll pull it up for you. But if you want to tell us a little bit about what folks can expect in session two, that'd be great. Well, we're going to go through um, three categories of things. Things you can do that are dealing, like I've mentioned with the laundry already, that are parts of the day-to-day -day chores that in the household that are difficult. Um, and so that you can actually turn problem situations into executive function skill building situations or like organizing the room so that it'll be a better study space, you know, do it in a partnership, you know, help them become aware of the challenges they face. So you could ask, for example, what is it? How is this, uh, is it easier in school for you to concentrate? What's the difference between the school uh, classroom environment and what we have here at home? How can we, so then they're thinking, right, about that's executive function, that's planning, it's evaluating, it's action right there. And uh, or how can we make your study space better for you? That's or great. ask, you know, what is it that distracts you? So, mm -hmm. there, so we'll talk about some situations like that where you turn a difficult situation into a, a learning experience. Um, then we can talk and then we talk about things that you can do just on the course of everyday activity like dinner table conversation games you can play that build executive function skills or when you go to the grocery store okay you know what types of things are we going to buy today 
And then you talk about categories because that's another executive function. Well, vegetables, fruit, dessert, meat, dinner, lunch, make some categories like that and ask them to say, what are some of the things that you like in those categories? And then they have the reward because then you go and buy those things. Uh, you know, you can have some control, of course, of what there is. But, um, uh, and then you also, if you need to, you can make a new category, things that are good for me and things that are not so good for me, but that people, you know, that it might be fun to eat, so I can't eat too many of them. And so there you're talking about executive function too. If you want to train, help the child's attention training, what do you see on the shelves? Uh, help me find, help me find, you know, the type of peanut butter we like. So, and then Jose, the last category is, are a bunch of actual games to play uh, between with parents and children that develop executive function skills. So that's what we'll be doing in uh, the next session in February. So one of the questions that's coming in is, um, are there any specific questions that parents should be asking themselves when, when interacting or if they interact, or they're starting to see difficult behaviors come out? When they see difficult behaviors come out? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a great question. So you're going to be better prepared for those situations by your own executive functions if you have a plan, right? and you can monitor yourself and you have a little checklist of what you need to do. And one of them is recognizing how frustrating and angry this can make you, but maybe that's not gonna be useful. Uh, being very clear because the children have, um, some of them might have trouble you know, with longer sentences, more complex instructions. So very simple, clear instructions. I wanna be very clear what I expect and what they what they need to do. Um, and then um, anticipate, you know, that there might be some negative reaction uh, or pushback and uh, how you're going to make what you might be able to do. Take a, a couple of deep breaths, even suggest, well, let's, let, let, uh, let's take a couple of deep breaths and think about this. Uh, but have your clear limits too. So you know exactly you know, what you expect, be able to say it simple and what you won't do and what you will do. And maybe this is something that again, in session three, uh, other parents can share ideas. What do they find helpful for themselves and being able to control their own reactions? So you know, we can think about it in these different categories. Um, let me start with the category that this talk is about, executive function. So say to myself, I understand because of what I know about executive function, what's difficult for my child in this situation. And maybe I can even label that and with a little, you know, empathy and not be, and that might help me not be as angry and frustrated. You know, I know because of executive function problems. So, um, and then that might help me titrate in little pieces what I want to say instead of too much attention, too much uh, to require too much sustained attention for something that's too complicated. So you want to be aware of the, uh, of the executive function limitations that we've talked about today and helping guide you how you interact with the child and then be aware of your own executive functions to manage the reactions which are all too understandable but don't make you feel good and don't make them feel good and don't work in the situation. The frustration mm -hmm. and the anger, for example, or the guilt. Well, thank you for that. We have a, a couple of questions in, in the Q&A uh, about saying something along the lines of, we understand how this this is could be applied with, uh, with children who are younger, but can this also be applied to teenagers and how, how can we apply uh -huh, yeah. certain things to, to our teenagers who have intellectual disabilities or you know emotional disorders? Yeah, yeah, same principles. Executive function problems are, for example, prominent, they're the cause of depression when we think about it in terms of brain terms, uh, brain areas and functions the same parts of the brain that are in charge of executive function um, are compromised in depression because uh, they're important for managing one's own emotions, one's anxiety and one's mood. When we're talking about substance abuse challenges, the same thing. Um, so what's different with uh, older children? Um, 
the, well, first, you, you, the things that are the same are important to keep track of. Just because they're older and they're bigger doesn't mean that they have the organizational skills of the executive function um, necessary to keep to manage their time, to keep track of their assignments. You know, I, I know high school kids, and you know they forget to do their homework, right? So uh, they misplace the, the the things they have to work with, um, work on. So again, I would work with them on uh, on the, using the making with them as partners a schedule and a procedure and writing it down since they can read well. Or, I mean, I'm not sure exactly. You know, I don't want to make, I know there's a lot of variation in situations that you all face, but generally speaking, the older children are going to be more able, more able to, to read. And so to be able to make a, a schedule with them with a list that can be referred to and have it posted on their study mm. place, have it posted on their in the refrigerator, key places in the house. We call those, it's another thing that we will be talking about called external memory aids. So when you have trouble with internal memory, uh, trouble with maintaining sc schedule, you put it external outside so you can look at it and be reminded about it. So I would say, take uh, remember with the older children that they still have the same executive function problems, many of them. Remember that you need to engage them more as partners the best you can and use that executive function part of self-observation so that they can be partners in understanding and dealing and working out a plan with you and then use these external uh, aids and tools to compensate for areas that they have weakness. Thank you. There's a, there's, here's another question. Uh, it says, I feel like I do uh, a lot of planning for my child, preparing what they wear every day, making beds, um, just to speed things up. Is it bad for their development of ex executive functioning skills? So Vygotsky is a famous Russian uh, developmental psychologist, and he had this concept of the zone of proximal development. That means the thing that you are just reaching that's within your reach is a place for the child to be challenged so that they can then grow. If it's too easy, it's not going to be helpful. And if it's too hard, it's not going to be helpful, right? Just at the right point. That's the challenge for teachers and parents to know what that is. So if you've been doing all those things, we could say that was necessary. But at some point, you're going to want to be handing little bits of it over to the child and to figure out a way to do it. Another thing that Vygotsky said is that what was interpersonal process, something that two people do together, becomes internal structure in the child's mind. So that if you do some of those things together, so we're going to make the bed together, then that's the step for the child to be able to make it by themselves afterwards. If you're going to worry about what the child's going to wear the night before, together choose the clothes. The next step is that you stand there, watch the child, give them some verbal help while they choose the clothes and put them out in the right place in the morning to wear. The next step is you ask them to do it when you're not in the room, but you come in afterwards to check and compliment them and remind them. So you see how those are steps, little steps where you're handing over part of the executive function that you first provided the way you described the way the questioner described that she or he does all these executive function tasks hand them over in small enough bits to your child so there's uh there's a lot of a lot of questions coming in a lot of them very uh personal about uh individual child needs around their ieps and folks for those of you who need help, specific help with your child's IEP, we're encouraging all of you to shoot us an email at specialeducation at schools and nyc.gov um, so that we can, we can help out and, and uh, with any issues that you're seeing and supports that your child may need. There's also some comments in here from some folks who are joining us on the Spanish line saying that, uh, that the, the presentation was very helpful and they really appreciate your time. Uh, so Dr. Wexler, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining okay, us for thank the- you. 
upcoming five sessions. Your next session is on February 23rd. Okay. Uh, so uh, I just want to uh, give a plug to that. Um, I also, we're running out of time, so I'm going to, I want to uh, share with everyone that the next session that we'll be, we'll be together for the next Beyond Access series is going to be next week, um, January 26th. And that's going to start our social and emotional learning session. Um, uh, so we're going to be talking about how children uh, come to understand illness and how to explain COVID-19 with them. And we'll be joined by Dr. David Schoenfeld uh, from the uh, National Center for School, uh, for School Crisis and Bereavement uh, for the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. You will all receive a link for all of this um, and the follow-up email for attendees. You'll also receive a link for that uh, survey. So please, if you have a moment, take some time to fill out the survey and let us know how, how you are experiencing these sessions and what we can do to improve them. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of compliments um, in, in the, in the Q&A. So thank you all of you, all of you who are typing in. Um, and we're looking forward to expanding the session with you, the series with you all and seeing you all join. So look out for our emails tomorrow with the recording to the session, the link to the survey and the link to the next session so you all can register. And then when you do that, do me a personal favor and share that email with two of your friends so that we can make sure that we get the most people in here so that everyone who needs it can get the information. Uh, but until then, Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you again, Dr. Wexler, and we will see you all next week. Have a great night.